So the um, Center for Sleep and Circadian Neuroscience, as I said, is a work in progress. And um, I think one of the important features that we have is we actually have a new building. Um, so the a new clinical sleep center, which was really built to be a clinical and translational research center, um, is at uh, Birch Street, about five minutes from here. Um, and we have the whole first floor of this building, and it's a beautiful um, sleep lab, and I'm gonna show you some of the features of it. Um, but let's talk about why sleep and rhythms <clears throat> are important for um, UCI brain. And that's because sleep is really um, integral um, to every life form, and if you think about circadian rhythms, you know, pretty much everything has a circadian rhythm, even um, single-celled organisms like algae. Um, in terms of the human situation, and actually most animals that have brains, we know that sleep is required for brain plasticity. Um, and sleep and rhythms together organize the regulation of our synapses. Um, we used to think, um, and to quote Alan Hobson, that sleep is of the brain, by the brain, and for the brain, but we now know that sleep is really important for all aspects of physiology, both within, within and outside the CNS, and it's critically important for health. Um, to just talk about the relatively new history of um, the SCN um, Sleep Center, or the SCN Center, um, <clears throat> UCI has been known for its strengths in circadian neuroscience. We have uh, several really eminent uh, scientists here, Paolo Sassoni Corsi and Todd Holmes. Um, we have other um, sleep scientists here on campus, and we're one of our um, missions here is to try to bring everybody together and actually have everybody do sleep research. Um, and uh, one of the reasons I came here a few years ago was that this was one of the only academic centers that I was aware of, actually the only one that didn't have a sleep medicine program, so it was a great opportunity. Um, and two important things happened, one of which is in 2017, um, we got a seed grant um, from UCI to help develop the center. Um, and secondly, we built the new center uh, in Newport Beach, and we built it so that it would have state-of-the-art capabilities both for research and clinical work and be an opportune site for people to do translational research. So one of the things that we have um, is we have um, high resolution or high density EEG. We can do 256 channels of EEG all night long on people or during the daytime, um, which is really important because we need to start thinking about sleep as not a one dimensional behavior of like how many minutes did you sleep or how much time did you spend in a particular sleep stage, but to understand that Sleep has three dimensions in the brain. Not all parts of the brain sleep the same way at the same time. Um, and furthermore, sleep has a temporal component. Your brain is different when you go to sleep at night and when you wake up in the morning, and stuff is happening all night long, and we have to be able to look at it. So we like to use um, high-density EEG across sleep as a brain imaging tool. It's probably the, um, it is the brain imaging tool that has the best temporal resolution. We can sample at 10,000 hertz if we need to. Um, here we have in the bottom right a picture of one of our eminent sleep scientists, Dr. Bryce Mander, in um, an electrode cap with one of our technicians. Um, and <clears throat> when we um, put on the electrode caps, we can uh, look at important sleep waveforms um, on the upper, do I have a pointer here that works? Maybe not. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so that's where sleep spindles are most prominent um, in the vertex, and here are slow waves in prefrontal areas, and spindles and slow waves are thought to be uh, critically important for some of the functional aspects of sleep, and they only occur during sleep. Um, some examples of other things we're <clears throat> trying to do in the lab is we're uh, partnering with the Beckman Center um, and Hamamatsu to add um, uh, oximetry, basically brain oximetry, using neuroinfrared spectroscopy. This is Rob Warren, um, who is the postdoc who has been working on this. Um, and because typically what we do is we do look at pulse oximetry. Um, and this is what we do in sleep labs and most sleep research. However, what's going on in your finger may not really be very representative of what's going on in your brain. And it's really your brain that needs the oxygen, um, not so much your finger. <laughs> um, and in fact, the patterns of oxygenation look very different in the brain. This is um, basically a number of minutes 
Um, we're looking at about a 15 minute period here. This is an apnea where someone has stopped breathing and we can see following the apnea, because it takes a while for the blood to get from the lung to the finger, uh, we see a drop in blood oxygen level. Um, but here uh, in the, looking at, with near-infrared spectroscopy at the prefrontal cortex, we see a very immediate and dramatic drop in oxygen level. Um, my <clears throat> interests have been largely on looking at, uh, more recently, at um, local changes in sleep topography related to a variety of neuropsychiatric and sleep disorders. Um, and here's one example, one of the most common sleep disorders, sleep apnea. Um, and what we see in comparing groups of individuals with sleep apnea to normal controls is that there is a decrement in slow wave activity in these posterior regions of the brain, um, which actually map onto the posterior cingulate cortex, and this is in the absence of an apnea. And the severity of this loss of local slow wave activity is related to the severity of apnea. Now the reason this is quite interesting, we've been talking a bit about Alzheimer's today, is that um, sleep apnea is a major risk factor for Alzheimer's um, disease in terms of earlier onset and more rapid progression. Um, and if we actually look at slow wave activity um, in groups of individuals who are at risk for um, having Alzheimer's disease because of family history or ApoE4 status, um, but do not have sleep apnea, we generally see that they have these decrements um, in, sim in slow wave activity in similar areas of the brain as well as some decrements in frontal areas. Um, and uh, this raises the issue is that if apnea is also causing decrements in these areas, and we know that sleep is important for clearance of amyloid and for decreasing production of amyloid, um, this may be part of the link between apnea and Alzheimer's disease. And right now we're doing studies to look to see if treating apnea slows Alzheimer's progression in people who are asymptomatic but um, uh, amyloid positive. Um, Bryce Mander, I'm going to now run through a couple of our uh, faculty that have started doing work um, in the center or related to the center. So this is our high density EEG team. This is Bryce without a cap on um, and some of his staff. And they've been finding that um, again in individuals at risk for Alzheimer's that losses of spindle activity, and we think spindles are also important for learning and memory, loss of spindle activity is correlated with tau deposition. <clears throat> um, we are, let's see, did I skip something? Okay, no. All right, next, um, this is one of our new graduate students, Miranda Chapel Farley, um, who is very interested in sleep um, and exercise, but uh, has been uh, starting out by looking at, uh, in collaboration with UCI Mind and the consent to contact uh, registry that they have of several thousand individuals. Um, she's found that people who um, have subjective sleep problems also have memory complaints um, and that the people um, that sleep either um, less than six hours or more than eight hours have more memory complaints than people who are sort of in that golden spot of getting at least six to eight hours of sleep at night. Another investigator, we're working with um, some of the scientists in neurobiology and behavior, and to follow up on Andrea's talk with some of the mouse models, we're trying to see how um, mimicking sleep apnea in a mouse, um, we can't make it snore or um, stop breathing that way, but we can expose it to intermittent hypoxia, well actually Kim can, and we're trying to see um, whether this intermittent hypoxia is um, accelerating uh, Alzheimer's pathology, and this is something we can do with these various mouse models to try to understand some of these links. Um, similarly, Norbert Fortin is um, looking at sleep fragmentation and trying to understand some of the neural mechanisms of why intermittent hypoxia or sleep interruption may be contributing to Alzheimer's pathology, again, in rodent models. Um, Mark Mapstone is working on looking at um, metabolomics uh, and inflammatory markers that uh, may be uh, increased uh, or altered with sleep disorders or sleep disruption or sleep deprivation and how those are contributing to uh, neuronal dysfunction and uh, neurocognitive effects. 
Um, so a lot of uh, work that we're doing uh, related to normal and pathological aging, but we're also very interested in children uh, because sleep is, of course, extremely important for neurodevelopment. And in con collaboration with uh, PERC, um, uh, we are looking at the relationship between um, sleep and aerobic fitness. So we know that um, teenagers, of course, need to sleep, they need to exercise, they need to eat properly, et cetera. Um, and so one of the questions is, if you exercise but don't sleep, do you get the same benefits in terms of um, cardiovascular risk factors and also improvement in your fitness um, as if you exercise and sleep well? Um, conversely, if you sleep but you don't exercise, probably that's not going to be as good for you either. And so we have an opportunity to start to look at these interactions. And going even earlier, we're working with the Conti Center um, and Tally's group, um, who has collected just some amazing data on um, sleep during pregnancy, uh, postpartum, and in um, uh, children as they grow up. And so some of the questions we're interested in is how does mom's sleep affect their children's sleep? Um, and how, do the, how does the sleep of children affect their mothers and vice versa? And that gets into this idea of disruption and disorganization of behavior because sleep is, of course, a behavior that needs to be well organized. And so far, um, what Ivy's found is that controlling for the level of depression, um, mothers who are not sleeping well while they're pregnant tend not to sleep well after they give birth, and they have higher risks of postpartum depression. And this is another example of where disturbed sleep actually contributes to psychiatric disorders. So this is just sort of a sampling of what we're doing, and we're just really getting started. So we want everybody to think about sleep when you do anything related to the brain, because your brain doesn't function well without sleep. Um, and we're all happy to um, try to help out. And we have a beautiful new lab, um, and if you have um, you know, gadgets you want to test or you want to come and do studies um, and use this equipment. Um, it's, it's really some of the nicest clinical research space we, we have at UCI now. And I'm going to finish up. This is a sleeping anteater. Um, and to see, um, if you have any questions. <laughs>